and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Now, in its latest Malaysia Gender Pay Gap Index, the Statistics Department has found that on average, for every 100 ringgit that um, Malaysian men earn in terms of salaries and wages, women receive only 66 ringgit and 67 cents. This is a sharp decline from the average salaries earned by women in 2021, which was 96 ringgit and 21 cents. Now, what is the reason for this decline and how can policies address this? Um, joining us on the show to discuss this further, I have with me Li Min Hui. She's an analyst and in the Social Policy and National Integration Division at the think tank ISIS Malaysia, where her research interest centres on policies to mitigate gender equality, with a particular focus on childcare policy and equalising outcomes for women in the labour market. Min Hui, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. How should we be understanding this uh, significant downward trend in the Malaysian Gender Pay Gap uh, Index? Thank you, Melissa, for having me. So on the outset, if we look at the numbers at face value, it does look like there's been an increase of about 30% in the gender pay gap. But if we look closer, the dosum has announced that this disparity is a result of the change in methodology of how estimated wages are calculated. Previously, this was calculated by using a simple ratio of men's and women's mean wages. And if Dosum had actually continued to use this methodology for 2023, we would really find no difference in the gender wage gap. But uh, the Dosum has since adopted the UNDP's method of estimating men's and women's earned incomes, which essentially takes the GNI per capita, multiplies it by women's share of the wage bill, and rescales it by the women's share of the population. Now, this represents a more comprehensive or nuanced way of calculation, which will allow for more accurate comparison globally. But we do, not, do need to understand that it doesn't reflect the full picture of wage inequality. For one, it doesn't tell us what the wage gap is, and how does it, how, whether it reflects between men and women doing similar work, whether this gap derives from differences in education levels, experience levels, hours worked, or personal career choices of men and women, for example. But what this estimate does do is that it points to evidence of discrimination when it comes to wages between men and women. So the statistic of women earning 66 ringgit for every 100 ringgit earned by men essentially could be a more comprehensive or accurate number, but it still doesn't paint the full picture. Right. Okay, well, let's dive into some of the nuances of this. So when you s said it doesn't really reflect uh, maybe you know whether there is equal pay for equal work, talk to us about occupational segregation because that often contributes to um, ge the gender pay gap. We know that women tend to work in some lower paying um, occupations. You have healthcare, education comes to mind where it's predominantly women. What efforts do you think can be put in place to um, ensure that there is equitable compensation in industries where women are um, disproportionately or over-represented, uh, over represented, Minhui? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, but for us to ensure equitable compensation, we do need to understand the factors that contribute to the gender wage gap. And a lot of it has to do with gender roles and norms that disadvantage women in the workplace. Mm -hmm. For example, even in high wage work, employers tend to reward mainly those who can work long hours. A lot of the time that will be men. And if we look at the work that's been done uh, by the Nobel Prize winner, Claudia Golden, it points to how women workers prioritize temporal flexibility. So the ability to be able to choose their own work schedule uh, how many work, how many hours they want to work in a day because of household and care obligations. So we want to see more equity in wages in general and not just for occupations where women are highly represented. We do have to allow for more work flexibility. We need to enable workers to choose their work schedules and more work from home options. Another step is to ensure that workers have access to labour protections and family-friendly policies. Now, Malaysia has updated, uh, for the most part, updated its labour protections in line with international standards in the Employment Act 1955, but it still has some ways to go. We need longer paternity leave, shared parental leave to distribute the burden of caregiving in the home. And we also need better protections for part-time workers, which is where women are overrepresented, because they want that flexibility. 
Uh, and we also like, need to look at creating legislations that prevent hiring discrimination of women by employers. That is also one of the reasons for occupational segregation, women being unable to get into these areas of work. So we also need to look at legislation, the entire ecosystem, and finally, investing in the care economy. We need to allow and facilitate the growth of affordable, accessible and high quality care so women don't have to drop out of work completely or cut back their working hours and income if they have care obligations. Right. So, so these are great uh, policy frameworks that are definitely needed to achieve uh, gender pay parity. But can I ask you about the role of um, corporations, corporate leadership? You mentioned discrimination a little bit earlier as part of your uh, what answers. And I was wondering what corporate leadership um, can do or can help in narrowing that uh, gender pay gap we see. Yeah, I think corporate culture and leadership is absolutely crucial towards closing the gender pay gap. So work cultures and workplaces are often designed by men for men. So there is a structural change or structural overhaul that needs to happen for us to close the gender pay gap and achieve inclusivity. We know that gender bias and gender stereotypes are difficult to change, but top down policies could mitigate the impacts of those widely held beliefs and normalize a shift towards more inclusive work settings. So this looks like investing in family-friendly policies, like I said, shared parental leaves, flexible working hours. One thing I really like is for leadership to really lead by example. That, look, that might look like bosses taking paternity leave themselves. We know that even with, with long paternity leaves, even if there is legislation for that, a lot of fathers tend not to take it because they fear the uh, repercussions or the penalties they might accrue for their career. So if leaders take, up, take that up, I think it will be a great example across the board. At the same time, we also need to start setting measurable targets for gender equity across organizations. Uh, we also need to re-examine hiring, retention and promotion policies that do not disadvantage women for the mother, mother for, for childbirth, uh, for taking care of their children. And we also need to start thinking about how our workplaces can encourage and facilitate women to come back to work. How can we ensure they don't suffer penalties simply because they've been away? It could be as simple as hiring women who have had career breaks uh, because they've had to care for their families and not disadvantaging them as a result. So comprehensive and wide-ranging equity initiatives by corporate culture and leadership will be really, really important. Well, based on, on your work, are there consequences if we don't address this head on and we you know we see a new methodology that might give us a more accurate representation of the true nature of the gender pay gap what are the long-term consequences um, both economic and social if we leave this problem unchecked if we do not address this issue head on with a lot of the um, more you know, unpopular or difficult structural issues that uh, structural po um, policies that, that need to be put in place. Right. An unchecked gender pay gap will have a wide range of effects. Firstly, it will have a compounding effect on a woman's lifetime earnings, her career progression, her access to social protection, all of which will impact how much money a woman will have in retirement. In fact, this will mean that we will have more women retiring in poverty. And this is a very precarious situation, which is worsened by the fact that we know that women tend to be the ones who care for their families, even in old age, whether it's for their partners or for grandchildren. So beyond the individual level, level, the deepening of a gender wage gap also leads to unstable conditions for a crisis. If we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, that was, you know, it's a prime example, basically. It was women who were disproportionately impacted. It undermined the ability also to care for their dependents, worse still if they were single mothers. And this, of course, affects not just women. It has a snowball effect. It affects children, elderly, especially those who are income, literally the most vulnerable and people who are likely to fall between the cracks, who experience disadvantages as a result, and this could compound over their lifetimes as well. So countries with low levels of gender equality also suffer economically. Not addressing the gender pay gap means that we are essentially leaving in place all these barriers that prevent women from fulfilling their economic potential. It undermines inclusive development and it keeps our societies poorer. So really, the time for action is now. Mm, definitely. And on that note, Minhui, what do you think, what immediate measures would you like to see um, that you think will help rectify this concerning trend when it comes to gender pay um, parity or disparity, if I may uh, use that? Uh, what do you think uh, needs to be done now 
to address this so that in one year's time when I call you again that we're not seeing this downward trend continue that perhaps we're seeing it move in the opposite direction? Well, given how pervasive gender roles are, I think a low hanging branch is a, a focus on transparency and accountability. I think we need to start mandating employers to publicly report on the gender wage gap. Countries like the UK are already enforcing this for large companies. And this is important because it helps keep companies accountable and it keeps progress measurable. We also need to start enforcing, like I said, hiring discrimination policies, which the Employment Act 1955 fails to do despite recent amendments. So what is important is that we need to legally define exactly how gender discrimination works in hiring, promotion and retention, and formally address them, extend the role of the Director General of Labour to decide on gender discrimination in the workplace. This is important because job seekers, especially women, are at a disadvantage when they are perceived uh, as assuming caregiving responsibilities later in their career. You know, it affects them before they even get the job. That's how bad it could be, right? It's important to also, it's important because if we add in racial, ethnic, and class differences into the equation, this means women from different groups will have reduced agency and bargaining power. So the legislative framework and policies need to be solid, needs to be in place, and needs to effectively account for discrimination. But on the other hand, we also need to start looking at building a diversity of care options that working women and families can access, like care configurations like workplace child care centres, adult daycare centres for the elderly, home health aids, really integrating choice into the care economy. Excellent. Minhui, very quickly, you talked a little bit about the uh, intersection of di different um, races and socioeconomic class. Could you elaborate a little bit what you mean by that? Well, I think... Um, just looking at how all of these things work, um, I, I like to take an intersectional lens uh, to look at labor. We do know that gender is but one marker of difference that affects discrimination, but this differs according to race, it differs according to class, and it differs according to kinds of agency that people are called based on where they stand in society. So I think in Malaysia, when we talk about gender discrimination, we have to be quite aware that race and ethnicity and class plays a big role. And when it mixes with gender, we see women at the lower end uh, receiving the brunt of this uh, discrimination. We know that during the pandemic, lower income women suffered the hardest and they already had the, the least access to social protection, the least access to any other kinds of services that could help them. So moving forward, it is this intersectional lens taking into account gender, race, ethnicity, class that will be really important for Malaysia if we really want to be inclusive. Minhui, thank you so much for sharing your insights with me. I appreciate your time. That was Ali Minhui, analyst at ISIS Malaysia. We're going to take a quick break and consider this. We'll be back with more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Let's continue our discussion about the gender pay gap in Malaysia. As it was recently uh, revealed by the Statistics Department that on average, Malaysian women receive only 66 ringgit and 67 cents in terms of salaries and wages for every 100 ringgit received by men. Joining me on the show now is Tan Ihan. She is the Executive Director of the Think Tank Research for Social Advancement, or better known as REFSA. Ihan, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. How are you interpreting the recent data reflecting this significant, the notable decline in, the, in gender pay parity in Malaysia? Hello, Melissa. Thank you for having me. Um, my interpretation of the latest data is I would say that it quite accurately reflects the persistent issue that we have uh, on our current state of the gender pay gap. Uh, if you look at the headline numbers, they look quite appalling, especially if you compare to previous numbers. But I want to talk about uh, this in two points. Yeah. So one is on the statistics itself, and one is the reality, or at least the perception that, that we have. Statistics-wise, it's a bit more straightforward. So any conclusion we can make from the statistics is also highly influenced by the methodology used. And as men ad admitted in the report itself, DOSM used a different methodology than the one previously used. 
Um, just very quickly, if we go a little bit more technical, the previous method was calculated based on female to male wage ratio. So that's a very uh, 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 simple calculation. It's just by subtracting the average uh, wage level for women from men and then dividing it by the average wage level of men. So it's a very simple method. It's generally accepted and is used by many. Whereas the latest one adapted the UNDP's method of calculating uh, what they call the estimated earned income. That is based on a wider set of data. So data including like the female and male share of economic active population. So how many uh, female is actively uh, uh, economically active or can contribute. Uh, the ratio of uh, female to male wage in all the sectors, uh, female and male percentage within the population, and also um, including the gross uh, national income in PPP terms, which is the purchasing power parity. So you can see that the latter um, method includes more factors, uh, more data points. So that inevitably reflects a different headline figure uh, to, represent, to represent the number. Uh, moving away from the technicalities, right? Let's talk a little bit about the reality. Now, regardless of the sharp drop, one thing is quite clear. Uh, I think Malaysia still has a significant gender pay parity and it hasn't moved much. Comparing to other countries, uh, Malaysia is one of the biggest gender gap in Southeast Asia. We fare better than countries like China uh, and, and even Japan, but we are worse than our neighbour countries like, like Singapore. And uh, last but not least, the 2022 figures uh, provided by the Global Gender Gap Index shows that Malaysia has sort of fallen a little bit. Um, the year before, in 2021, we ranked 80 out of 146, so we're a bit ahead. This year, according to DOSM, we are 93 out of 146 mm -hmm. countries. So actually, you see that we have um, regressed a bit, but I'm glad in this re recent report, because of the sharp decline in the headline figure, at least it's being highlighted and discussed. All right, yes, definitely. And I think there are nuances in that uh, headline figure that we need to uh, look into. Can I ask you, Ihan, about um, the differences between what, what we see as a headline figure of a gender pay gap versus this principle of equal pay for work of equal value? How do we understand the two? One is about an average between men and women, uh, be the differences between men and women, and the other is for the same pay for the same amount of work. How should we think about these two concepts and um, strive to achieve parity in both? Okay, um, equal pay for equal work is to simply put it for the same job with the same responsibility and the skills, whether men and women are paid equally. So you can have a, uh, say, a senior manager role. Um, a, a man who, who goes and, and, and uh, look for this job and a woman who interview for this job, if they do get this job, are they being paid equally? So that's a different, uh, slightly different concept to gender pay par uh, parity because your gender pay as well, you also include the entire, uh, in the, the entire sector, the entire gender of women and men. Now, the complication is that for women, a lot of us or um, some of us will have to make difficult choices when it comes to managing household, when it comes to pausing for your career and so on. So you may come to a scenario where if you are, say, 35 years old, you have a young family, you may not be earning as much as uh, somebody, a, a man who is 35 years old because they are way ahead from, uh, uh, compared to you, whereas you have two, three years of not working. That's the gender uh, pay gap. So mm -hmm. those are two different concepts. Now, when we talk about equal value, the question we should ask ourselves is whether these two individuals, whether they are men or women, do they produce the same productivity? That should be the yardstick of, do they give you the same uh, output uh, for, the, for the company? There are no, currently no legal mandate of equal remuneration for work of equal value in Malaysia. So our Employment Act generally treats women and men equally but it does not explicitly mandate equal pay for the same work. So I, have to, I think we have to acknowledge that in Malaysia, um, there's a bit of a asymmetry relationship in that. Right. So, And we, if we were to look at the gender pay gap, uh, the one that's been um, revealed by the, the statistics department, how do you view the intersectionality of race, of ethnicity, of socioeconomic class, um, impacting what we already see as a significant disparity reflected in the current pay gap statistics? 
Uh, so I think the biggest impact on the current pay gap statistics is the social and the socioeconomic factors. Um, so the nuances that you know race or ethnicity places on the society creates expectations on women going to work and staying in work so that they can command like equal salary. Uh, let me broaden our scope a bit more. Let's compare, say, um, Asian versus certain Western culture, right? Where I know, for example, at overseas, my female counterparts, they actually stand a higher chance to earn uh, well or at least earn a lot and stay in the course of a career because, number one, her husband could be more willing to con consider being the stay-at-home dad, for example, or the dad can take on some unpaid work, for example, taking kids to soccer. So, get, so that the mom can stay back and, 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 and do her work and stay in the workforce. Separately, society may be able to support women's decision to go back to work because they are better childcare. There are um, uh, uh, benefits that you can give for women who work, who have children, so on and so forth. So these factors are very important in ensuring that women, if they choose, they can go back to work, they can stay in work, and they can also upskill so that as their job becomes more and more demanding, they can stay at the same uh, uh, same level of pay compared to their male counterpart. Mm -hmm. um, the other factor is socioeconomic wise, um, we have to admit if you're from a more well-off family, at least from this part of the world, number one, you get a lot more help on unpaid mm -hmm. work. So that allows you to continue to work, improve your skill set, you know, progress in your career, you seek promotion, you demand same salary, so on. Um, and of course, children from financially well of family, they are able to access education uh, in a different way. Uh, education is still very important in ensuring that you have a, uh, a, a higher chance of uh, getting a job with a good pay and staying on the payroll as well. So these are some of the factors that uh, women in, 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 in Malaysia will have to contend with. Right. Can I ask you then, Ihan, I mean, what are the ways in which um, employers can help close that gender pay gap? Um, are there strategies that businesses can adopt if we're looking at addressing this issue more effectively? Yeah, so the overall idea should be to ensure that women has an equal opportunity and equal ground to continue to be in the workforce and of course <clears throat> move up the, uh, the career ladder. Um, number one, I think we should all speak up. Many studies have shown that women in general, for example, they feel more conscious when they ask for a pay raise. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we help women to ensure that they can demand the same pay? How about, for example, uh, uh, making it open uh, about the range of salary that you pay for each role? So these are the skills that you require. Uh, 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 a typical average wage is between seven to 10,000 ringgit, for example, right? Um, many women need to juggle work life with family family life. So perhaps employers should not just look into pay, but also or also benefits uh, offering flexible work options, such as, um, you know, ability to work remotely, flexible hours during school holidays, uh, stay, uh, so on and so forth. Um, how about creating an office culture of empathy and psychological safety? For example, for instance, uh, and this is very nuanced, right? Women need to feel safe to leave work early uh, to take their children to the doctor, for example. Will, will, will my boss be, be angry at me, like suddenly I have to leave, you know, so on? Will my uh, colleagues be able to take on some of my role because my, you know, my, my child suddenly has high fever, my husband is not around, so on and so forth. So it's important that business don't penalise uh, women um, also who left their roles for a certain time off, right? Uh, conducting pay equity analysis evaluating your hiring criteria, your pay grade, evaluating all this. Are there biases uh, that, that we don't know? So on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of things that businesses can do and there are a lot of things that government can, uh, can do as well. Okay, uh, I do want to ask you just very quickly in the couple of minutes that we have left. Uh, the Malaysia Gender Gap Index measures disparities in four sub-indices. One of them was political empowerment and I'm quite curious to know, Ihan, whether you have observed um, a correlation between political empowerment of women um, and the narrowing of the gender pay gap. It, does it pay to have more political representation of women to influence policies around pay parity? Yeah, so I definitely think it makes a big difference that women are represented in a political and corporate leadership uh, representation. Uh, it should be that that case because I think women and men, we are equally capable 
uh, if we look if we look deep enough. Now, uh, my own observation is that the correlation at the moment is not very high because women representation in these areas is already in itself still a challenge. Uh, um, our, our, our women representation are doing their best, I can see, but how much these women can do to change the status quo? Um, they are taking steps. A lot of time it's two steps forward, one step back. There is a lot of resistance uh, to actually um, narrow the, the gender pay gap significantly that it can be felt for most of us who are not there are many, many women who are not in this arena. So for us to feel the difference, we may not see the difference, but that's different from saying that it is important and we should continue to push and to ensure that more women are being represented, uh, especially in our political arena, in the parliament, in the higher corporate leadership, so on and so forth. I think it's, it's been uh, uh, discussed widely, like for example, in COVID, when you have a female prime minister, how they manage the COVID, uh, uh, it's, it's quite different. You know, it remains to be seen in hindsight what happens, but I think that trend is carrying on and it should be. Ihan, thank you so much for speaking with me. Dan Ihan from Refsa there, wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off thank for the you. evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night. Thank you.